So, Hispanic Heritage Talks 2020, what you're looking for, yes. I am so delighted to be presenting my friend, former classmate from Argentina, Matias Dufino. Matias is a global, design lead, a global brand lead designer at UNICEF. Um, he has a, pow a passion for communicating ideas and messages for social change using graphic design. He has been working uh, for the United Nations for about 17 years. And then he started working about three years ago for UNICEF. UNICEF stands up for United Nations Children's Fund. In his time at um, the United Nations, Matias created hundreds of campaigns. We're going to have a blast seeing like all the work that he has been doing. Um, and then I have to tell you a little bit about Matias from my personal experience. So I met Matias in um, college in Argentina. We both started at the same university, University of Buenos Aires. It's a public university and it's free. We were like uh, in some class that we, you know, we met. I was uh, reminiscent with Matias about that. And um, then I moved to the United States 20 years ago and unbeknownst to me, Matias also moved to the United States 20 years ago. So it had to be through AIGA that we reconnected because you know, when you move and before like Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp and all these things, uh, you wouldn't stay in touch with people, especially uh, after you move far away. So I was at the AIGA in Phoenix conference. Uh, I think it was called Pivot and I saw him and I was like, I remember that guy. So what I did, I went to the attendee list, you know, when they like, they post all the attendees in the, in the conference and I found him and that's how I was able to track him and then connect with him. And since then we have been like, you know, in touch pretty much every day through WhatsApp and Facebook and Instagram and all the possible social media. I had the pleasure of inviting Matias to come to uh, Houston in 2018, he was a speaker for um, our own conference, Inside Job, and he talked about his work at UNICEF there. And also uh, he spoke to my students uh, at the University of Houston downtown. So I cannot tell you how excited I am of having Matias today because he has been connected with, with my life for many, many years. Matias, the floor is yours. Gracias, uh, Natasha. And I want to um, start, I'm going to share some the screen. I hope you guys can see it. Can you see this? All right. So um, thank you, um, Natasha, and thank you all. I want to start by saying that I really know, because of I know Natasha so well, how much effort goes behind the scenes in trying to organize these uh, talks that you guys I've been doing like I don't know how many a week I know it's crazy work for you guys this is a voluntary work okay you do this for free and it's amazing just to share with people uh, our passion which is design right so thank you all of you the board of um, AIJ uh, Houston for uh, your time and your passion on on this I've been able to see a few talks so I, I know what I'm talking about um, so, I would like to start by sharing my experience of um, how I became uh, a graphic designer, a social graphic designer, I would say. And I tried to share full screen mode. I hope it works well. You guys um, let me know if it works. Matias, can you speak a little bit louder? It appears that Carla, our translator, is not able to hear you well. All right. Can you see the first slide? Mm, it only appears black. Mm. Technical okay. issues. Uh, now I can see it. We share again then. Oh, yeah? You see yeah, the Paku? Yeah, the university, and I see it with the, with the border okay. with Zoom and all that stuff, but yes. Um, is Carla awesome. able okay. to? Can you, yes. Can you hear me okay. well, Carla? All right. So I'm gonna again gonna try to share full screen and hopefully it works. Can you still see the university? 
Uh, yeah, but it's not showing full screen yet. It's just showing with the border, with the with the preview. It's still in preview mode. Okay, interesting because it looks like full screen here. So okay, let me just I will show yeah. it again. So like, like, you know, um, right. share your desktop. <clears throat> there now we can see you full screen. Good. Awesome. <laughs> Woo, okay, COVID time soon. All right. So, um, 25 years ago, 1995, I was 20 years old and I was a graphic design student at my dear University of Buenos Aires where I met Natasha. And I want to say a parenthesis that I'm really grateful for my university because it's a public and free university. I'm very lucky to have had an education um, for free. Um, thank you, Argentina. Thank you, University of Buenos Aires. Um, so I was given, I was like in my second, third year of university and I was assigned this project on child abandonment. And it was kind of a thing that it really touched me. Um, you know, when you see sometimes in the news all the time, like uh, a baby is abandoned sometimes, uh, the doors of a church or in a hospital, many times uh, young mothers that feel overwhelmed because they do not have maybe economic support or emotional support, family support, and they don't, they feel overwhelmed and they leave the babies. Uh, so I, I remember seeing every time I would see this back in the days, even still today, it was really moving. And suddenly I had the chance to work on a campaign. Uh, and it, it was again an university project, right? but still I was really engaged on trying to come up with design to address this issue. Um, can you see the next page? Awesome. All right. So one of the things I remember back in the days, our professors uh, at the university used to tell us, uh, okay, what are the most important things that you need to do when you start a design project? So there are three things, uh, research, research, and research, okay? <laughs> Basically, it was all about really, really getting informed before you could try to convey a message. And so what did I do back in the day? I went to the UN and UNICEF, United Nations and UNICEF offices in Buenos Aires, trying to look for information. Information, um, getting into the offices of UN and UNICEF, uh, looking for information and suddenly seeing all these amazing uh, posters, uh, huge banners with children from all around the world, different races, colors. And I, I was really like impressed. And I remember asking the people in, uh, in the UNICEF office, like, uh, do you guys design all these things? And I remember they telling me like, uh, no, no way. This is coming from headquarters in New York. And that's how I felt so small, right? Like, oh. Okay, like, you know, my dream started right there, but I, saw, I knew I was going to be difficult, right? It was, it was coming from headquarters in New York. So this is the job, this is the project I, I ended up doing after that research. I was so inspired that I really spent a lot of time working on it. Uh, it was like a public service ad series, like uh, two ads for a magazine. And um, still one of my favorites, actually. Very simple, very you know, elegant. The copy was not amazing, so don't even care. Don't even worry if you don't understand, because it was all really about the image, right? Um, so that's where I start dreaming about, I kind of like this. Um, I used to call it useful design back in the days. Um, then I learned that social design was a better term. And that's how you know, my dream started to really I want to do social design, I really would like to work at the UN and UNICEF. Um, that's how I landed in May in 2000, like more than 20 years ago, to New York. My design life was divided between the UN and UNICEF. This is the UN building, and then across the street is the UNICEF building. Um, so I'm gonna try to share it to be my experience um, showing like designs I've done since then for the UN and for the UNICEF, okay? So we'd like to start by saying that, um, okay, 
UNICEF is part of the UN. There are many uh, fund programs and agencies that are part of the UN system. UNICEF is one of them. Um, so how is this signing uh, at the UN or UNICEF? Well, both are in one, more than 190 countries and territories. So meaning we have a, quite an audience that is uh, very complex, very multicultural, multilingual, and that's one of the big challenges, right? How to address uh, a message, to reach out to a big audience. So I guess it's all about transcending boundaries, right? That's the beauty of design. And when I say, you know, uh, boundaries, I mean like every single, reaching out to every single person in every country around the world from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe, as we like to say. And I, I guess the magic of uh, design as a universal language that can really be understood the same way by people from different cultures and, and places around the world, if it's properly done, of course, right? So this is my life, okay? I'm a designer working in an in-house graphic uh, design team. We are like three people. Um, I'm the brand lead designer, and my job is about dealing with the multiple people, players, uh, basically what we do, these design assets, this brand guidance that we work, we need to offer it with all the 190 offices uh, of UNICEF around the world. We work very close to the social media team, the web team, vendors, which print sometimes our, our products, other designers uh, in, the, in the building or in the organization, uh, illustrators, photographers, translators, proofreaders, clients that are sometimes people, internal clients that come from other offices asking us for projects, right? So what is the secret to really work well uh, as in any other place in the world, I guess, is work as a team, work really together. So we, many times my daily, uh, in, in my daily um, work day, I, I really interact with many of these players. So the secret is teamwork. Okay, and I like to use this uh, quote from Aristoteles, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And I really believe that, I really believe in teamwork. I even learned this before being a graphic designer when I was a rugby player and, and when I had hair, even like it was like a long time ago, I was the second one <laughs> here. And my dear club Italiano in Buenos Aires. So I, I always value really the power of, of teamwork. And I'm really happy to have an amazing team. So how is working in UNICEF and the UN? Okay, it's amazing. Uh, there is uh, actually, UNICEF is gonna turn 75 next year. The UN is now actually the 75 anniversary. So we have 75 almost years of legacy in design. Amazing designs, posters, you can see some of them here, even like uh, from like normal human beings like me to like Marsha Gal, uh, people who have designed posters for UNICEF and the UN. And um, many of these might be familiar to you, um, like a trick or treat uh, initiative from, from UNICEF is very well known, uh, especially in the US and in Canada. And I do remember very much uh, the holiday cards. My dad, I remember him uh, in December writing, like uh, addressing each, you know, uh, card for a different person. Like, uh, and I, 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 I always have very good memories about seeing UNICEF uh, holiday cards. And I remember when I joined UNICEF, many people asked me, like, are oh, you gonna be designing the, the holiday cards? Like, no, no, not really, it's much, it's much more than that. So maybe you want to see, okay, show me this. I want to see your designs, right? What have you done uh, in these 20 years of social design uh, between UN and UNICEF? So there you go. That was my first design um, in the UN system. I was an intern and I was asked to come out with a sign uh, and, uh, using a smiley face. I, my English was really bad. But then, um, and I was really not sure that I understood properly. I asked a few times and they did like a very like a sketch of a like, smiley face and the word a smile. And so I, I was asked to do this in six languages, in the six official languages of the UN, which are English, 
French, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. Uh, so I asked a few times, what was this about? Uh, I didn't um, really didn't uh, understand what they say, but I, I got that was something related with the Millennium Summit, which is the General Assembly of the UN, it was uh, back in 2000. So it was a big deal, right? It was the, the, the GA, the, this Millennium Summit, a lot of people coming, it was a record in history. And so it was something related with that. Um, so this is the General Assembly at the UN. This is a UN building, part of the Skyland in New York. Um, two years later, I have already forgotten about this uh, signage that I had to do. I find this photo in a magazine. I believe it was Time magazine. Um, I saw this photo and immediately I recognized, oh, this was like the General Assembly at the UN in 2000. So I started reading like, world leaders attending the Millennium Summit at the UN headquarters post for a group photo in September 2000 in New York. The gathering of 149 heads of state at the summit is the largest gathering of world leaders ever in one city. So I start, I continue reading the, the, the article and then I got to a point where it said how challenging it was and a lot of pressure there was to really make when the photographer was taking this photo to make sure that it would be a good shot. And how do you make how to make sure that everybody was going to look good uh, at the same time in this photo, right? So guess how I uh, my banners, my smiley faces, actually I guess help to uh, make uh, all the most powerful people in the world to smile at the same time in the same place. So that was my first design <laughs> at the UN. Probably not very intellectual in terms of design, but okay, you know. Not every day you make a smile to the most powerful people around the world, including like Arafat, Fidel Castro, uh, Clinton, um, Tony Blair, De La Rua, which was our president 20 years ago, and even Putin that's still around. <laughs> okay, so that's how my story started with this um, smiley face design. The next one was a little bit more challenging, was actually designing the poster for the Millennium Summit. And was already there was already like this was based on a, an agency that you know um, had already come up with something similar. And I add this photo, I change it a little, and I could give my you know my touch to this design, which is a uh, iconic. Now that is twenty years later. Another interesting project was also related with the General Assembly of the UN was this um, branding, the visual identity that we were asked to design at the UN. And I don't know if you can recognize, but this is the UN building. And the idea was to have a mobile approach, something that would really be sustainable through the years. So basically this number now is, we are in the 75, uh, 75th session. So this number keeps changing every year, right? So now we have a 75. So in case it's not clear, here is a photo of the UN building. This is the UN headquarters. This is the General Assembly dome. And so I replicated that in the design, the flags. So I came out with two strong, I saw there were strong um, proposals, design proposals. They went for the top one, okay? Another interesting project and I like to show this because of the simplicity. One simplicity is one of the key issues that you really need to uh, accomplish when you design from the UN system. So this was about end raping war, was about um, sexual violence in conflict, very uh, delicate issue. And the idea was to try to communicate, to convey it in a very simple way. That's why, you know, this person that you cannot see the face, but really looks like sad, worried, and this kind of a sign, it's very simple, like kind of a traffic sign of a huge hand, you know, like in big scale and the person, you know, the victim is trying to protect herself, himself. Um, so one of the secrets, I guess, or requirements of designing uh, from the UN, from UNICEF is to be simple enough so everybody can understand, even people who are not able to read, okay? fifteen percent of the world, the population of the world is illiterate, so they cannot read or write. So that's important that when they see a design, ideally, they might get an idea even without having to read, okay? 
So different collaterals, every time you design a digital identity, then you need to come up with different products. And you never know where they're gonna end up. Could be with a goodwill ambassador, Robin Wright in this case on the left, or even in the hands of a peacekeeper in uh, DRC Congo. Talking about peacekeeping, this was a nice poster also designed um, a few years ago for the UN Day. The UN Day is actually coming soon in a, in a few weeks. It is the October 24th is the United Nations Day. We used to have a concert every year. This year, I guess, COVID is not gonna allow to have that amazing concert. Uh, I remember being lucky to see like Steve Wonder, Sting, Tony Bennett, amazing people coming to perform for the UN Day at the UN. So the challenge that year was, it was a tribute to peacekeeping. So that's why I was trying to say, okay, how can I combine in a smart way, music, right, and, and peacekeeping. So and maybe just to make it clear, peacekeepers usually wear a blue helmet. That's why the blue helmet here, right? Very subtle, very simple, but still uh, effective. Cyber hate, danger in cyberspace. This was actually a very interesting topic. Uh, was the audience were, were children, and even the people speaking, the the, the ones, uh, the panelists were all children. So it was very interesting to uh, the, the, all these uh, kids came to the UN to talk about their experience in in, in cyberspace and, and how uh, dangerous it must be and how careful you need to be. So that's why this language, uh, this illustration that it, uh, was trying to be uh, attractive and appealing to children. Small arms. Uh, is, this post is about stop the illicit trade in small arms. Um, I remember that was uh, kind of difficult to understand how to convey this uh, message asking, talking to the client, trying to realize how to address it. And we realized that, okay, they didn't want us to use uh, images of victims, of course, no images of guns, uh, no arms at all. So, okay, what can I do, right? Then that's how I, after reading a lot and trying to do a lot of research, I found that statistic that every 10 minutes, five people are killed by small arms. We've been already here for like half an hour, 30 minutes, like 15 people just die in this half an hour, victim of small arms, just to give an idea. So I saw that maybe these uh, like bullets, holes could represent those victims in a very subtle way. Still talking about simplicity, uh, innovation in Africa, and combining the idea of the light bulb and the continent of Africa, the shape, super simple. This was uh, one of the posters that people liked the most. And this is about the International Day of Commemoration in memory of the victims of the Holocaust. Um, another very big uh, high level project, the mission of Israel at the UN proposed this day at the General Assembly to have uh, January 27 of like the, this international day to commemorate every, every year the victims of the Holocaust. It was approved and then once the international day is approved at the UN, designers need to come up, to come up with um, a visual, right? So we were all given this task, we were all involved, every single designer, we were about seven, eight designers, everybody was working in trying to come up with a solution. Um, I remember it was also very <clears throat> complex, right? The, the trying to understand what the client uh, was trying to, was needing for this project. Um, <clears throat> I remember asking questions, a lot of questions like, okay, what do you envision? Should be something, this poster should be something like, um, should you look to the past? Or, should look at the Holocaust, of course, should look at the past and, and trying to, to really focus on what happened. Okay, or, or should we look into the future and maybe have a, yes, of course, we need to look into the future, okay, and be like hopeful, optimistic. All right, so I was a little confused. And then I asked, okay, in terms of like the tone, like mood board, 
designers might understand what I'm talking about. Do you imagine something like dark, uh, like low key? Yes, of course, it's the Holocaust, you know? Okay, um, but so not, not, what about the idea of maybe being colorful or a touch of color? Well, actually, yes, because it's about the future hope we learn from our own mistakes as a humanity. So yeah, why not? So maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe it should be colorful. So I was absolutely confused when I was leaving that meeting. So it was actually a lot of contradictions. And maybe those contradictions actually helped me to come up with this idea, right? This kind of combination between the tragic, the death, pain, and, and, and this flower of like hope, and also trying to make a po point that we, as a humanity, we should learn from our own mistakes. So that's the design in action at the GA every year on, on January 27. We have this big event that a lot of people come from around the world. Um, it's very uh, moving to see the um, survivors speaking during these events. And then you never know how um, different countries around the world are going to really uh, treat your ideas, your designs, uh, very interesting. That was in India. And they came out with this kind of um, hammock uh, hanging from a barbed wire and this hammock um, almost with this organic uh, touch, with like uh, plants, uh, re recreating the idea of, of the banners behind, right? Very, I, I, I always uh, get surprised when sometimes I look what other offices of UN or UNICEF do around the world to replicate their ideas or maybe take it to a different level. The beauty of languages, and again, languages, typography plays a key role. And look, look even at the scale, that space that maybe the Chinese takes here compared with the Arabic, you know, that some languages really take a lot of space compared with others. So it's always challenging, right, to, to try to find a balance when you need to come up with multiple languages. I always was told, in, I remember in university times back in the days when you design a poster, try to make it as simple as possible, that it should work well as a stamp. Okay, honestly, I never imagined that one poster that's the one that I showed you before, was wanting to end up being a stamp. So it was not only um, in English, but in German, in French, which uh, that's because of the UN. Uh, actually, the UN is the only one that without being a country, have their own postal office. And usually uh, because uh, there are three like uh, headquarters of this postal office in New York, in Geneva, and in Vienna, that's why they have these languages, right? English, French, and German. This was actually an initiative by the um, Israel Post that came to the UN, trying to pitch this idea. They really love the design uh, for the Holocaust, so they wanted to make it stamp. So it was actually a joint issue between the UN and the Israel Post. This is the ambassador on the left of uh, Israel at the UN back in the days, and this is the Minister of Communication, I believe, during the launch of the stamp. Okay, uh, you might be familiar with these uh, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, these 17 goals that trying to somehow um, indicate uh, how to, to have a common agenda uh, globally in governments, NGOs, uh, organizations, uh, private sector to really uh, protect people and the planet, okay? Um, this uh, actually, this uh, SDGs or Standard Development Goals uh, run from 2015 to 2030. Okay, we are supposed to reach certain goals on this, on these, and all these 17 different uh, subjects. But before even having these SDGs, as we call it, um, there was a big discussion around the UN and around the, the world about sustainable development. And I remember. I was given this project, I wasn't sure, uh, I wasn't really familiar about sustainable development myself. Um, I remember asking a lot of questions and even trying to get like um, keywords, right? Like, like what are the pillars of sustainable development? That opened a big discussion at the UN, I remember for a while until they came, up, came back to me with these three 
key pillars, social development, economic growth, and environmental protection. So they say, okay, it's impossible to come up with a logo that really uh, consolidates these three different topics, but maybe you can come up with three icons. And I thought, okay, yeah, I can't do that, but I don't think that, you know, I, I believe, I'm a believer of like less is more of uh, trying to, to be, uh, you know, apply syn visual synthesis and I still got three icons, maybe might not be the way. I tried to push for like maybe one solution. They say, okay, good luck, you can try. So I tried <clears throat> and it wasn't easy, right? And so sometimes when I, it's not easy, what I'm trying to figure out, I try to leave my comfort zone, like even physically, so that's the UN building you can see in the background. So I kind of cross the bridge, cross the, the river. And I took some uh, distance from my you know, routine and I tried to be inspired by nature and start like doing some sketches, trying to figure it out. And you know, sometimes you, after a while I was like really blank and, and I was kind of frozen looking at the skyline, contemplating. And so there was this like, um, push this plan that was really moving, it was really windy. And I was surprised of, of that, right? And I was uh, feeling like, how cool. It, it looks like um, somehow the, you know, the, um, the nature is embracing uh, civilization, right? The skyline. And I said, okay, maybe, maybe I can feel inspired by this. And so I start doing more and more sketches until I got to this kind of idea. Uh, like, you know, the leaf being like nature, embracing the civilization, and then the human being on the bottom. So it's about people, not only, you know, uh, the environment is, you know, all as one, actually. Um, and then that's uh, the, the final, actually, after, of course, I did a lot of uh, different uh, versions, but that was the, the winner, right? Somehow similar to, to, to that sketch. Of course, even though when you are comfortable with an idea, you still need to pitch it and you cannot show one, you need to show several options. So that was me trying to pitch uh, these uh, different ideas. Uh, I think that the winner is somewhere in the middle. Even by location, 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 I was trying to position this idea uh, in the middle of the table so to grab people's attention. They uh, finally went for that one. I was lucky that the, that the one that I felt was the most uh, strong idea was chosen and then they asked me okay can you pitch it uh, we need to explain this in a call to like 20 different uh, offices around the world to get to get it validated so it was it was like i don't know eight years ago and maybe the idea of uh, conference calls were not that much part of my life and i was a little um concerned because how do i explain a design on the phone on a call and i said after so much work, months of design, uh, you know, uh, proposals, and, and I, 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 I was concerned. I was really uh, scary that, okay, this might be the end of my idea. So what can I do? And that's how I came up with this idea. Okay, maybe if I can submit, like I can really make it easy in one slide, in one simple way to explain what is this log about, showing the three components of the three pillars that together, come uh, as one with this logo. And if I can maybe email this uh, a few hours before the meeting, this might totally help to sell it. And it really worked well. And that was the one that finally was chosen. And here is the kickoff of that uh, Rio Plus 20 Sustainable Development Conference in Rio de Janeiro. Still the biggest conference ever at the UN, right? Because it was a very important topic, right? Sustainable Development. So you never know uh, uh, how the law is gonna be applied. We we be in different scales from like a pen, and like a notebook to like big banners uh, outside the UN headquarters or even in the conference uh, convention center. It was in Rio, right? And one of my favorite sports uh, when in my spare time is Google in it. Google uh, to 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 use Google to. <laughs> search for the campaigns in different languages and then you find all kind of things like like um, interviews in, in, in cnn like interactions with google ambassadors have not from here 
I even found like the very cool stamps from the Correo Argentino, from the Argentinian post office. So like a t-shirt uh, competition somewhere around the world. I don't know, this was done by us, this kind of collateral. So I don't know, I have to say that it's always amazing to see where the logo might end up. And I confess that I never thought that was going to end up being in a cartoon in the New York Times. <laughs> never say never. So, uh, International Day of Peace was actually a few weeks ago, every September 21, 21st is like International Day of Peace. And this was, I did this like nine years ago during the, I don't know if you guys remember, the old enough uh, participants here, the Arab Spring, that where people uh, in the Middle East start like going out uh, the streets trying to ask for democracy, right? So for the International Day of Peace, we thought at the UN, okay, maybe we can validate those uh, protests, but always, you know, reinforcing people to make their voice heard, but in a peaceful way, right? Peace and democracy in a peaceful way. That's why that um, dove, uh, hand kind of uh, mix uh, visual elements to convey um, that message, right? So that's the design in action outside the UN as a gate banner during the event uh, at the, in, in one of the conference rooms with Michael Douglas to be wondered. And this is um, another project, also one of my favorites, because again, the client, uh, this was for the International Year of Forest, and the client asked me, okay, how, um, after, you know, my first attempt was, okay, we, may, we need a tree here, right? Probably the first idea that comes to my mind is a tree, if you're talking about forest, and I say, yes, but wait, it's much more than a tree, forest, provide shelter to people, habitat to biodiversity, food, medicine, clean water. So they say, why don't you come up with a series of uh, icons? Again, you know, people love icons, seem to be. And I love icons too, but I didn't think that having like seven, eight different icons was a solution for a visual identity. Again, a visual identity should be something that's very simple, very minimalistic, that can even fit in a lapel pin, let's say. So I said, okay, but let me think about it. Let me see what I can do with these icons. And voila, that was a solution, right? To put them together uh, with the shape of a tree. So everybody happy. Uh, they went for this option. Look at the challenge of the languages, right? We, even though we design uh, basically always in these six official UN languages, both of the UN and UNICEF, Sometimes we help with other languages, right? Especially when there's a kind of um, unusual font, we try to do it ourselves. So here are some of them. Here is the design in action on an animation at the General Assembly Hall. Some banners we did, you know, always there's a lot of different collaterals that are part of the campaign. And then again, my favorite sport, Google. And then I go and search for the campaigns to see what people do around the world. So some of these is us actually, this label team, this projection on, on the UN building. But then I found this kind of amazing thing, like this projection into the Brandenburg gates in Berlin. Uh, then I found somebody came up with like the logo in real size in wood. And you know, the, the icons, the different icons you could uh, detach and attach, they were magnetic, amazing for like, Imagine like schools when you're trying to make uh, children like engage with, with the different components of a forest. Look at this in Montreal, like uh, this amazing gardening approach using the logo. And even like, again, in Germany, somebody came up with this idea of uh, maybe replacing the icons uh, above the tree. And my German is not really good, but I believe it says without forest, there is no tarsan. Very cool. 
And so this is a poster. The client asked for a poster. So I, we met and the, the client said, was very clear, like, okay, just make the logo bigger. So I thought, okay, I did this and I wasn't really impressed. I think, okay, it's, it's a nice logo, but sometimes the logo by itself is not enough to make an impact, right? Yeah. And I thought, okay, what can I do to take this to the next level? So I went to a park a few blocks from where, from where I live. I asked for, to work from home, which back in the day wasn't that common to get an okay to work from home. Now is our daily life. But I remember I asked for a Friday. We have a really, um, we have to deliver a proposal by Monday, I remember. It was a Monday and then that I asked the Friday before to see if I could work from home. I went to the park, I grabbed some soil, some leaves that I found on the floor and I came up with this. So clearly more organic approach and if you compare you know, what the client asked for versus what the designer, what I proposed, I guess my lesson learned here is that you need sometimes to challenge the client, you know, to really try to, the client needs, the client knows what they need, but sometimes they don't know how. And that's when designers, when us, we can really be creative, right? And challenge, challenge the client. <clears throat> so, Maybe after uh, these few approaches that I share with you, you already have an idea of the challenges of designing for social change from the UN, UNICEF to the world. Visual simplicity clearly is a must, uh, especially because you never know the scale that this design might work, the context, and also because some people maybe uh, may have some uh, disability that really um, it's preferable to really be simple in the language you express uh, through design. And the use of images, when you are talking about a certain issue, you don't want to really um, associate directly an issue with the country, with a race. And so you need to be very careful when, when using images in a design, right? You don't want to, if you're talking about poverty, you don't want to link poverty with certain race or with certain country. Or region because you know these are all global issues usually the use of color is always challenging right and colors mean different things in different places in different countries in different cultures so sometimes you apply a color into a design and might not really convey what you want and that's not even the issue sometimes the issue is even worse when you might end up offending <laughs> your audience by using a color in a, in a, a wrong way uh, which it's happened to me. And, and then, uh, St. God didn't go to the audience, right? But then uh, the use of typography, again, I show you a few samples of how uh, sometimes different uh, challenges when it comes to the space that different languages take on the layout, on a design. UNICEF, let's talk a little bit about UNICEF. That's where I've been working for the last four years in the brand team. And so UNICEF is about saving children's lives, defending their rights, helping them fulfill their potential from early childhood through adolescence. Um, so one of the challenges is when you, where your brand is an acronym, uh, not everybody is aware of what those letters stand for. Uh, you know, we did a global survey a few years ago, like four or five years ago, uh, the global level, and then uh, we realized that not everybody really uh, links UNICEF with children. Even people who have very good um, awareness about um, image of UNICEF, still they don't say children right away when you ask, okay, what is UNICEF about? Believe it or not, some people around the world, uh, when, when, when you ask about UNICEF, they think that it's a soccer team, okay? So what do we do about this issue? And then, okay, we need to bring the child to the surface, right? And, and, and making, making it part of the logo. 
So we came out with this uh, logo signature, UNICEF for every child. Every time you could see UNICEF, it would have to come with the for every child or para cada niño, it depends the language. We came out with 70 different languages uh, for this UNICEF logo signature. And the idea was to make it in a way, this for every child, not only that to be part of a very strategic move, clearly, to make sure that everybody links UNICEF with child, with children, but also um, how to be creative in collaterals, right? In every product, poster, postcard, social media, you name it. How to be creative in a way that this for every child could be interesting. So, for instance, like you can say for every child in Africa, for every child in Syria, for every child in Argentina, I don't know, or for every child, like, based in uh, trying to focus on topics like for every child clean water in this case for every child love for every child vaccines for every child education so it really this modular approach we realized it was super uh, creative and could really open the game to focus on different topics on different places and regions um so i have designed this i remember like this was like a couple of years ago and then I remember thinking about, okay, I really love this approach of for every child education, but I wonder if maybe we should show this that in, in a way that really makes this clear that UNICEF not only works on education, but it works in different topics. So that's how I came up with this, right? We call it the Unisphere. So basically to really show the big picture and without having to focus on every single word to get that idea that UNICEF is really working for every child in different topics right so then i thought okay and what if i want to focus on one but in the context of the whole of this whole different topics right but what if i want to highlight one like education before okay there you go still works well right so for every child education for every child safe home and here is the series of posters and some of the series some of them different executions that we produce. Um, here are like balls. I, I, you know, I, I, and I couldn't say that it's an evolution. I think it's a flexibility when it comes to brand to portray this uh, tagline that we have for every child in different ways. And both are, uh, I guess, uh, interesting and, and depends the situation you would use one or the other. Here are the, this uh, Unisphere uh, concept in action in retractable banners at the UN during the World Children's Day. And here is a um, gate banner outside the UN headquarters. Look how beautiful it works even in other languages. So going back to the idea, right? Then uh, like a year ago, I was trying to, we were trying with the team to challenge ourselves. So how can we reinvent this? How can we find another way to, to, to approach this um, unit field, right? So with the team, we start playing and say, okay, maybe it's not about the words. How, can, how, how about working with icons? So there you go. Still works quite well, right? For every child, so many different things that units have worked for. And then we thought, okay, what about fixing words and icons? There you go. Still works quite well. And then we were uh, very excited and we start thinking about, okay, how can we implement this in different collaterals, right? Like uh, told back in this case. So all this exploration, all these ideas, we usually consolidate them in a brand book, right? Um, I worked for two years working on this rebranding of UNICEF like four years ago. When I joined, and uh, the idea was to try to um, have consistency. That's one of the most important things for a brand is to be consistent, right? Consist consistency is trust. Trust is support. So that's why it was so important to make sure that UNICEF would have the same, would be um, perceived the same way in every country around the world in these 190 plus countries. So everything is consolidated into this uh, little booklet that took two years of my life 
and this is one of the best moments in life. Designers might know what I'm talking about when you, after looking at that design for so much, for so many hours of your life on the screen, suddenly you have the print version, right? you can smell it, you can touch it, you can enjoy it. All right, this slide, I thought I was uh, trying to make the point of how much simplicity makes uh, really uh, a big difference in a good effective design. And no matter simplicity, if it works on a cell phone scale or even in a billboard in Times Square, like in this situation, simplicity always is a plus. It's, a, it's really the, the way to make sure that a design a billboard or even a social media post is effective. COVID, coronavirus, and we, six months ago, when this pandemic started, we, our work changed a lot, drastically, especially the first couple of months, and not only we were designing masks, but we were actually doing a lot of different collaterals. This probably you've seen all around in different buildings around the world and stores. And basically, we try to not only focus on the more like clinical information of you know, social distancing, wearing a mask, hand washing, but also on the, on the mental health side. You know, be kind, show solidarity, checking regularly, avoid spreading misinformation, be understanding, be well. You know? Trying to make sure that people to, to protect our uh, staff uh, when it comes to mental health. And talking about that, uh, we created this, we call it uh, MEGA, and not MAGA, please. I wanna make that distinction, it's got something else. So what is MEGA about? It's about mindfulness, activity, exercise, gratitude, and accomplish. So basically we came up with this campaign, it was an internal campaign, to try to again, make sure to, to, that, you know, to support our staff when it comes to mental health and, you know, uh, this was actually distributed uh, by email and also in our intranet. I'm really glad that we have a team that I lead this team that actually are not only doing graphic design, but they are amazing when it comes to illustration, are amazing when it comes to animations, video editing. Uh, we are really a small team, with, but with big uh, challenges. And we always try to deliver no matter in what format it is such as this amazing illustration we were asked, but one of the teams in UNICEF, the WASH team, came, us, uh, came to us asking for if we could come up with illustrations for social media, and was not the typical uh, approach for hand washing, like, uh, you know, I need to wash your hand for 30 seconds and sing a song. It was more about really uh, more like a warmer approach and trying to give tips to parents of how to make it like a family affair, right? This washing uh, issue challenge and how to make it easy, how to make the routine, how to make it fun, and how to make children understand why they really need to, not only that to do it properly, but why is that they need to really wash their hands. So, and it was quite successful. We did it in many, many different languages. Here I'm sharing English and Spanish. Um, we have five minutes, okay. Uh, so there are two key um, days, no? That we, that where hand wash uh, have a lot of visibility. Uh, one was back in May, the hand hygiene day, and one coming now next week, actually, global hand washing day. So that's where we usually show uh, all these amazing illustrations in social media. CRC, uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, 30th anniversary was last year. We created this visual identity, this logo. Um, we, the idea was to try to come up with something that uh, was really like joyful, fun, uh, not childish, but that could be enjoyable and could maybe, um, I, and again, I use this like a smiley faces approach. Uh, as you might know, I'm an expert now in smiley faces. So I said, why not using smiley faces? Because actually, these, you cannot associate these with the gender, with age, with race, uh, very like neutral. And also it's a language that nowadays we are really used to. 
when we see like um, emoticons, emojis in cell phones, we really, it's a language that we all find uh, familiarized with. Um, the language uh, challenge always in the six official languages. Look now the dimension, the dimensions from the Arabic to the Chinese, how different uh, they are, right? But still beautiful. Uh, and the best uh, part is when you see these designs in action. This is Kosovo. School students look at huge sign here. Um, so this is in UN headquarters. That was the, the big day of the celebration of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. So everybody has a voice from the Secretary General to terrorists to children, of course, this uh, young girl uh, from Ecuador, uh, indigenous girl from Ecuador, if I'm not uh, wrong. That's our uh, amazing Millie Bobby Brown, one of our Goodwill Ambassadors, and this was like a, a big day um, celebrating the World Children's Day and the uh, Convention of the Rights of the Child. That's the, again, at the General Assembly at the UN. Again, you never know where, when you're gonna be maybe walking on the street and suddenly see your logo in a yellow cab in Manhattan. I'm not sure where I found this online, but amazing, the logo. Uh, somebody, some country office probably came out with this, ideal for your living room. What about this amazing like projection in a building, governmental building in Seoul, in Korea? And difficult to score a goal here, but that's the logo, uh, amazing uh, approach as a cutout board, huge sign. It was in El Cairo, in Egypt. So I'm almost done, Natasha. Uh, let's um, look at the biggest day in UNICEF. Uh, which is the, our day, World Children's Day. It's November 20, next month, it's coming soon. We came up with this design, we, we call it Master Visual, which actually helps all the country offices around the world, every designer that needs to work on this in these 190 plus country offices, how to approach when they need to design uh, for World Children's Day. So basically we play with this idea of this circle, this like blue, kind of uh, UNICEF blue world, which would protect this like portal to this uh, UN uh, UNICEF uh, world that will protect the right of children around the world. And you can see the idea of the all in world, this uh, blue circle that how it becomes, you know, like the bubbles and how to, you know, somehow add like a festive celebratory mood to this design, which unfortunately this year we are changing it because COVID actually is not uh, making us feel like uh, we are in a celebratory mood anymore. Different executions of this idea with different photos, different part of the world. And here is um, the design in action. Um, we print out some collaterals and some posters that we also make available to all the countries around the world. Again, I get banner at the UN, outside the headquarters. Look how amazing this looks uh, in Korea, how they you know, open the brand in a very interesting way. And every uh, November 20, we try to turn the world blue, units of blue, so from like the Acropolis in Greece to the Empire State in New York, even like the Planetario in Buenos Aires, Argentina, we try to make all these iconic landmarks uh, turning blue for World Children's Day. And to end, I want to say that I really, um, I really believe in social design. I really believe uh, in the power of design to, to make massive change on people's lives on the planet. And it's not only that I believe on this, but I've been also a witness, right? Um, I've been like doing this for 20 years. And I think that in that comes not only like you become, 
like you finally have a lot of experience in something, but also comes a lot of um, responsibility. And with responsibility, I mean that I felt that I had to give back, right? And that's why, like six years ago, I started to to travel in my on my vacations, to travel around the world to try to give talks in universities about social design, and also trying to uh, bring uh, some of the posters I designed uh, in an exhibit called Making Hope Visual that's been already in 15 cities in four different continents. It's one of, one of those moments in, in Mozambique two years ago in the only institute of design in, in the country. So it was really nice always to interact with students and, and see how they you know, perceive these designs that we do, we create from UNICEF and from the UN. So uh, thank you all. I was supposed to be like in, uh, in India. Uh, uh, the plan, my plan was to, to be in India in, in October. Um, okay, I'm not in India clearly, but I'm at home, still in New York, but I'm glad to be sharing with you guys uh, all this presentation and I hope I can inspire uh, designers uh, and, and show the value of social design. Thank you. Should I stop sharing, Natasha? All right. Yes, please. Thank you. Gracias. Okay. So Q&A time. We have many questions coming in. Um, I was trying to multitask because I had uh, received questions in the chat uh, privately and translating some of them to help uh, Carla so she can uh, take a break when <laughs> the question is all popping on the screen. Um, so I move on to that. So we have a question that was from Chrissy. Um, did your minimalistic, simple style of design develop because that's the style the UN called for or because that's how you always design? En español es tu estilo minimalista y simple de diseño es el estilo de la ONU o porque siempre has diseñado así? Okay, that's a very good question. I, I guess it's both. It, it started because it's the UN style when again, because the, having such a, a diverse audience, you really need to be simple in the way you convey that message. And um, I guess after 20 years of working that way, I also, it became my style, right? Simplicity, which still is one of the um, condiments that uh, any good design usually, most of the time should have, right? No matter if it's UN, UNICEF or not, right? Simplicity is always, helps to convey the message in a, in a better way. Cool. I'm going to go through it because you have several. <laughs> so how many people are part of your team at UNICEF? What is the best, and also what is the best way to give constructive feedback to them and keep them motivated, to this, motivated during these stressful times? They are referring to, you know, the pandemic times. So in Espanol, ¿Cuántas personas forman parte de tu equipo en UNICEF? ¿Cuál es la mejor manera de darles una respuesta constructiva y también mantenerlos motivados durante estos tiempos? Very good question. Buena pregunta. I wonder if this coming from one of my designers, one of the team members of my group. Um, <coughs> um, okay. Um, Okay, we are three. Uh, we are a team of three uh, designers um, for the last year and a half. Before it was only me. I was a solo designer uh, for the whole world doing branding. So it was very challenging and little by little I was able to, uh, you know, uh, create this team that now we are three. And really I was coming from the UN when we were a group of like seven, eight designers. And I really suffered the first couple of years in UNICEF being by myself. I believe that design is teamwork. I believe that teamwork really adds much, uh, elevates the game. So I'm, I'm really happy to have this uh, team and how do I keep them motivated during these stressful times? I guess I always try to make sure that they are feeling well as, a, as you know, in, the, in, their, in their like emotional 
and health life, and that is a priority, and then comes work. I always try to make that clear to them. They are very committed, both designers, and it's sometimes to try to ask them to stop a little, to don't work. We know designers, sometimes we can't stop, right? We work like uh, sometimes 15 hours a day. It's crazy. I, I do it sometimes, and it's not good. And especially when COVID times, you end up burning out. And it happened to me twice already. This um, in these uh, pandemic times, I twice I really couldn't take it anymore, and that's not good. And I think uh, you really need to be careful and, and to know when to say enough is enough. And so I was lucky that um, my designers still like uh, doing well, but I'm always trying to to make them take time off um, because I think that's the the best way to really uh, uh, you know go through these uh, very difficult times, not only. To, to make good design, right? But to feel well. Yeah, that's, this is very important. What have been the most challenging campaigns you have worked so far? ¿Cuáles han sido las campañas más desafiantes en las que has trabajado hasta ahora? Mm -hmm. That's difficult, right, to say, but perhaps, perhaps the Holocaust one, because we were talking about uh, pain, uh, we're talking about six million people killed, right? And I saw that uh, I could feel the pressure of, of uh, like one mission, of one of the missions of the UN, trying to really uh, take this seriously. And it was one of the first time that all the designers were working on one project at the UN. I remember we usually were working maybe half of the team in one idea, the other half on other, or sometimes just individually working on, on projects. And this uh, poster, this visual identity for the Holocaust commemoration, where we're all working uh, hard um, on this. So uh, I, I, I think that was maybe the most difficult one, and perhaps the, the one that people like the most also. So I guess um, I, I always refer to that one and, and, and the story behind that, that poster, right? What topic would you like to design that you have not explored yet? ¿Qué tema te gustaría diseñar que aún no, no has explorado? You know, I think I've, I've been, I designed for almost every single topic that exists in the world because I, okay, it's, I spent 16 years at the UN, right? Now, the last four, I've been focusing on children, right? So it's all about children. Even though you, when you talk about children, you talk about, okay, uh, refugees, you talk about health, you talk about um, education. So even, even when you focus on children, you focus on different you know, topics. But when I was at the UN, I was really working uh, for the international days. We have like 150 international days at the UN. And we, I, was, I, was, I became, kind of became the guy doing the visual identity for many of those days. So I really learned and I really design on a lot of different topics. So maybe one that I would like to maybe work even harder is climate change, is environment. I feel like that is a key topic nowadays in the world. Yes, I know that uh, not you are an activist when it comes to the environment. And uh, yeah, I would really like to, to work on that a little bit more, and which also you know, involves children a lot. So yes that maybe is the one that I would like to work a little bit uh, deeper. Yeah, especially because the children are the future and we are not leaving a future to them. There so it's, uh, I, I cannot imagine the responsibility of, you know, designers communicating this uh, importance of climate change. So people become more aware and they also demand their governments to, to take action. It's not just like, single action by individuals, but now it's just at the global scale. So what you do, it's very important because you are working at a global scale. Absolutely. What ideas, books, or tools assist you in your everyday work? ¿Qué ideas, libros, o herramientas utilizas en tu día a día? Okay, I, I think I, I, nowadays internet helps a lot because you can really be exposed by following, uh, I don't know, people you like uh, or, or accounts that you like. Uh, I like a lot, uh, I follow a lot, not only design, but architecture, interior design. So I'm a graphic designer, but I really enjoy uh, interior design. 
environmental design, UX, I don't know, there's so many uh, different disciplines that are related with creativity that really help you to inspire, right? And I, I like to go to the museums. I was back at MoMA. I was back in a museum uh, last week and after six months, and I, believe it or not, I got, uh, I got moved. I, was, I couldn't talk. I was uh, trying to say something to the lady that was uh, scanning my ticket, and she saw that I was, I was like, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I didn't realize that I'm back to the museum. Uh, and she was also moved because I was moved, and she was, she said, I was, thank you for being back. We've been like very, it was very hard, five months without work. So I don't know, like art to me, like being able to be, again, to be close by a Van Gogh. Uh, I don't know, uh, it was like, I don't know. I, and, and then without tourists, right? It was very quiet, the museum. So I spent like a, a few minutes with uh, in front of a Van Gogh, and I couldn't believe that uh, nobody else was trying to take photo selfies. So I don't know. I think inspiration comes from many places. And um, even looking at the skyline, as you saw that with the forest process that I did, that sometimes just contemplating nature, amazing idea might come up to you. Great. Um, this is a question from our friend Julia Chu from uh, Tokyo, Japan. And she asked, how can visual communication design students engage in the activities? Any opportunities to volunteer or contribute? ¿Cómo pueden los estudiantes de diseño de comunicación visual o graphic design, eh, diseño gráfico, participar en las actividades que haces? ¿Alguna oportunidad de ser voluntario o contribuir? Well, that's a good question also. I'm not sure how to answer to that, but I guess, um, there is actually a program of, of, uh, for uh, volunteers, uh, designers who want to volunteer and uh, do internships in the UN system and UNICEF. Actually, the two designers that are part of our team started, they joined UNICEF as interns, and they, they evolved into consultants. So there's always hope, and maybe you can check uh, uh, and look for the website of UN and UNICEF when it comes to job opportunities. And there is a part that says uh, internships, that way you can really um, look if there is anything that might be interesting to, for students. And nowadays it's virtual, so it's uh, remote, so I guess it's easier, right? You don't need to come to New York and pay a big uh, high rent in order to be an intern uh, in UNICEF for UN. So uh, I would say that that would help um, a lot if you really want to contribute with design. That's fantastic. I hope that people take on that, that quest. Um, this is a question that I actually wrote that I move it down <laughs> mm. um, because, you know, it's a big thing, right? How did you feel when you moved from Buenos Aires to New York City to work for one of the largest organizations in the world? And I, I am asking specifically this as a porteño, uh, like a person that was born in Buenos Aires, very uh, attached to your feelings uh, of the environment, the place, and then moving to New York City, a different language, a different culture. Uh, ¿Cómo te sentiste cuando te mudaste de Buenos Aires a Nueva York para trabajar para una de las organizaciones más grandes del mundo? Y esta pregunta tiene que ver con la diferencia de vivir en Buenos Aires, Argentina, un porteño, y mudarse y dejar a la familia, a los amigos, y mudarse a una nueva cultura, a un nuevo idioma. Amazing question. How many hours do I have to answer to this, Natasha? <laughs> <laughs> Guys. That's why okay. I left it. I moved it. I had it first, and then I moved it down. A question very smart, very smart. Okay, I'm going to try to, to be brief on this. Impossible, but... Uh, okay, New York is New York, right? You cannot compare New York with any other city around the world. I love it, I hate it, it's difficult to explain. But honestly, coming from Buenos Aires, um, you know, Buenos Aires and New York have a lot in common. Are very cosmopolitan, a lot of uh, energy in both cities, so I didn't feel like it was a big change, you know, in terms of the vibe of the city. Again, New York is New York, right? It's not the same clearly, but still, it wasn't that such a big change for me. The big change probably came from like, you know, I was, I'm still a very family oriented guy, even though I'm single, I have no kids, but still uh, I, I really miss, you know, my family, my parents, my sisters, <laughs> <laughs> available, call now, 1-800. Um, I, I, really, I really felt, and I still feel like, you know, 
that is tough to, to be away from, from your family, from your friends. I was a rugby player. We used to move all together from one place to the other one. And, and that's one of the biggest challenges when it comes to maybe those affects, right? To the people you love and being, being uh, a far away of them, especially when it comes to crisis like the pandemic, where you really feel like being home and close to your people, close to my parents, and, and I can't travel. So it's always a toll that you pay by being far away. But again, I'm super grateful to have this opportunity to work for a big organization to really, um, you know, this sacrifice of this effort that we do. Everybody who, who is a foreigner and an immigrant knows what I'm talking about, but at least I feel like, uh, okay, I'm, I'm giving back something, right? I'm leaving something. I'm leaving some legacy and, and, and I'm using design for a good cause. Okay, yeah, I, I totally get what you're saying. Um, I received a few more that they are not in the slide, uh, but I'm asking from Pamela Napoles, what soft skills non what soft skills or non-design skills should someone have to work on social design? ¿Qué, qué tipo de eh, ¿cómo skills? ¿Qué tipo de habilidades? Habilidades, gracias. <laughs> Por eso no estoy haciendo traducción. ¿Qué tipo de habilidades um, o, eh, son necesarias para trabajar en, en diseño social? Nice question. You know what? Honestly, I feel it's about connecting. Connecting really with the issue, engaging when, with what you're trying to convey. So if you don't feel it, you know, I, I think that some of the best campaigns are the ones that you, that uh, at least that I work on and the, the best results came when I really was able to engage completely uh, on a subject matter. And I always try to do that, right? No matter what I need to design, uh, I always try to really give it all, you know, and really engage. And the more you engage, the more you, you understand what you're trying to convey, the better creativity is going to come out from out of that. So I guess it's, it's, it doesn't come from the, the professional side, but comes more from the human side of, of really providing a successful design. It's in the UN, when working in the UN, UNICEF system, right? context is about really to engage with these amazing topics. We're talking about human rights, democracy, development. So if, if you really have, have sensitivity as a human being, then that definitely is going to be easy for you to, to convey and to come up with an effective design. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um... And sometimes you don't learn those skills in school. You learn them as you as you work, but also you learn them from your upbringing and your environment. Yeah, your family, uh, school, for so many places, right? The, the value from rugby for me as a rugby player, I learn a lot about you know from different uh, places in my life. Yeah. So uh, one of our Unidos uh, um, team members uh, asked, uh, her name is Theo, ask when celebrities and artists like Millie, Bobby Brown um, and others get involved in partnerships with UNICEF, how does that affect the branding? Cuando artistas y celebridades como Millie, Bobby Brown y otros trabajan como, con UNICEF, ¿cómo afecta el branding? Diseño de marca. Yeah, it affects a lot, actually. Mucho, mucho. Uh, for good. Uh, it's, it's, a key, it's a key role, the one that the Google Ambassador have. A lot of responsibility, right? Because whatever you say, whatever you do, you have, and I have eyes on, over you, and always need to be on the same page of the values that the organization tries to promote, right? And, and I mean, it's for, for me as a designer, it's always also very uh, interesting that I'm really set uh, Cholulo. I don't really know much about celebrities. I remember when Millie Bobby Brown. Uh, work on the, she was like the host of the first World Children's Day activation like four years ago. I, I had to approach her to, I have this signing poster for, with the logo of the 70th anniversary of, of, of UNICEF. And it was like almost five years ago. And I remember approaching her and I was like, at the beginning, I didn't know who she was. 
I knew she was an actress, but I'm, I'm the worst. Right now, I love her. I look at certain uh, uh, um, things uh, like crazy. But I remember that um, back in the days, I wasn't sure <laughs> who she was. But I'm the worst, so you can compare me with anybody. But yes, yeah, it's, really, it's really nice to see all the, you know, how um, a lot of initiatives and, and are around these Google ambassadors. <laughs> And how much uh, they bring uh, traffic no? in the social media. If uh, Emilio A. Brown uh, posts something on, on, on Instagram talking about UNICEF, immediately will have, uh, I don't know, 10 times more uh, likes than, than the UNICEF account, right? So it's, it's a key, it's a key uh, contribution the ones that the Google ambassadors bring to, to the UN and UNICEF. Um, I have a, I think it would be the last question because, you know, we passed the time um, and apologies for the, the glitches uh, as we started. So the last question is, any guidelines for the use of color typography pertinent to cultural sensi sensibilities? Um, ¿Alguna sugerencia para el uso de tipografías o colores eh, teniendo en cuenta la sensibilidad de distintas culturas? Okay, uh, okay. On one side, we have a brand book that the one I, I, I showed you before that I spent a couple of years of my life working on this. So it really uh, addresses all that has uh, related with like colors. With you know, we are really, uh, I don't know if you are able to see how to make it, yeah, difficult to see. But yes, we have a very strict guidance, not strict, but very clear guidance on how to use colors and how to use. The periphery, because again, brand is about consistency. Consistency is trust, trust is support. And especially when you are a big organization, such as UNICEF, that is in 193 countries around the world, is really uh, challenging to keep co that consistency right? and to be perceived the same way. So really, it makes uh, a, a big difference when you achieve that consistency when applying the brand, when doing social media, when doing web, when doing animations, videos, no matter what you do, the brand has to be uh, well executed and, and be consistent. So that's, that's my role as a lead global brand designer, right? And then I could talk an hour about how we do that, but maybe it's not the time, but we have really uh, narrow uh, a couple of fonts. We have like seven, uh, eight, um, secondary colors palette, so we, we really we really have a lot of um, uh, uh, specific guidance on, on how to be consistent when it comes to using the units of run in every corner of the world. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's it's very important to like maintain uh, and acknowledge that not everyone will understand the same way how uh, our perceptions of how we communicate something. So it's important to also connect. Um, to the locals, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, so this will wrap up the Q and A. Uh, there's a couple more questions, and I just invited in the chat people to to stay around uh, after we we put the the last uh, slides. So if they want to say hi to you, and that way you know you could like directly talk to them, and Carla can take a well-deserved wait and break. Uh, so. Um, we have a survey, and this is important so we know about the things that uh, have worked uh, during these events, uh, especially for this one. Uh, we, we are like a volunteer group of people uh, from multiple chapters, and uh, we need your feedback. So if you could fill this survey, uh, the link is in the chat, and uh, it will help us plan uh, the rest of the remaining of our events and also what we will continue doing with AIGA Unidos after Hispanic Heritage uh, Month ends. Uh, we will have plans for events monthly uh, as, you know, as we move on. So you want to stay in touch with us. Um, thank you again to Matias uh, for being our speaker today. It was delightful like always um, thank you for everyone who joined and spent this time uh, on a Wednesday evening or morning from uh, Japan or everywhere else where you are thank you for um, Carla who has been translating non-stop for an hour and a half uh, yes. which is amazing uh, 
I, I wouldn't be able to continue <laughs> doing that. And thank you for the team, Efren, Jeremy, Marisol, David, and uh, also we had today helping uh, Dio from uh, Atlanta. Thank you so much for being here and help us create this type of content. 